Well, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us for this um, great chat that we're gonna have with Sarah Clark. I'm so glad that she was able to make time for us. Um, if you are just joining, please feel free to type your name and your PBA in the chat box so we know who's here. I, this is a pretty impressive crowd and I'm sure more people are gonna be rolling in. Um, Sarah definitely can draw a crowd because she's so wonderful and has so much expertise. Um, my name's Lania. I think many of you know me. I'm a fire advisor with the University of California Cooperative Extension um, and also kind of help lead up California PBAs and provide networking opportunities for y'all. Um, Delphine Griffith with the Cisco PBA helped pull this together. So thank you, Delphine, for, for making this um, happen. I think these are really useful for bringing us all together. So today we're going to be talking with Sarah Clark and Sarah is um, an attorney out of San Francisco with Shoot, Mahali and Weinberger. Um, and she and I have worked together for many years now. I don't even know how many, maybe six or <laughs> seven years on prescribed fire, fire related policy and um, education and all kinds of things. Of, just related to prescribed fire and cultural burning in California. And so we actually did a very similar discussion with Sarah last year, right around this time too, um, where we just set aside an hour and a half for us to ask questions and pick her brain. She has like a wealth of information, not only on like the current situation in California related to liability and prescribed burn associations and cultural fire, um, but also to policy changes that are happening, to new legislation that's just been introduced, um, to questions of federal policy. There's just so much. There's so much happening right now, and she's kind of got her finger on the pulse of all of it. So what I want to do today is um, some of you sent in some questions for Sarah. So I have those kind of curated and organized. Um, I'm going to, we're just going to have a conversation. So I'm going to ask Sarah questions, and I did not ask her to put together a presentation. I thought it would be better to have it more conversational. Um, so I'm going to ask some questions, and she's going to share some things with us. Um, we're going to start talking about just kind of general liability in California. So some of the, you know, just kind of laying the groundwork for this conversation. We'll talk a little bit about some of the policy stuff that's happened in the last couple of years and some of the things we're working on right now. Um, we'll talk about some federal issues related to liability with federal lands. Um, and then the claims fund, some updates on the, the prescribed fire claims fund that Sarah and I are working on. We'll also talk a little bit about permitting. There was a question that came in about permits and CEQA. Um, and then about cultural burning and some issues related to tribal trust lands and then also to this new bill that was introduced um, just in the last week. And then also about um, EPA laws and regulations around PM 2.5. There's some pretty like cutting edge and concerning stuff that's coming out there. And Sarah's um, got, got some information to share with us. And then we'll open it up and we'll also, we can kind of weave it in under those different topics. We'll open it up for you all to ask questions. So I know things are gonna come up as we talk. And so you can just use that like raising your hand function and then be able to ask questions of Sarah as we go. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. And Sarah, do you want to introduce yourself? I don't know if I adequately introduced you, but if you want to introduce yourself. No, you did a great job. Thank you for that, Lenya. And it is one of the great joys of my professional life that I get to work so closely with you and with all of you in the prescribed fire and cultural burning communities. Um, the one like little thing I just have to do at the very top, which is to say we will be discussing legal issues, but I am not providing you individual legal advice. And so um, the conversation, I'm sure we'll talk about some things that are specific, but just know that I can't give legal advice um, in this context. So if you need legal advice, contact me afterwards and we can talk about getting into a formal attorney-client relationship. So <laughs> that's my caveat to start, but otherwise I'm really delighted to be with you all. Awesome. Well, I thought we could start talking just, I mean, I think most of the people on this Zoom are pretty familiar with just the general liability situation in California. But um, that said, I still get questions all the time and even in the PBA world um, and from PBA leaders, just about like how this all fits together. And so I thought maybe you could talk about like, you know, just give your little elevator speech about liability, prescribed fire liability in California um, and how it's different since the passage of Senate Bill 332 um, and what parts of liability 332 pertain to and which parts it didn't. Great. 
Yes, good questions. Um, so let's start pre-2018 when we used to just be a pure, simple negligence state. So in that um, pre-2018 world, um, essentially if you had a fire that escaped and caused damage to a third party, uh, really through ever what, whatever metric, um, meaning like you burned something down, you caused a car accident, you caused smoke inhalation illness, um, you would be liable if you were negligent. Um, and then likewise, uh, if the state or feds had to respond to your escaped fire um, and they incurred suppression costs or they incurred investigation costs um, or other sort of relevant response costs, then you, again, would be liable for paying those costs if you were negligent. And negligent is um, the, the term in California really refers to taking actions that a reasonable person would not have done in the same or similar circumstances. So in, in assessing what is negligent, you have to construct this hypothetical reasonable person and look at what they would do in that circumstance. And then if you were outside the bounds of, of what a reasonable person would have done, then you would be found to be negligent. So that's the pre-2018 world. In 2018, we got Senate Bill, um, what was it? Yes, thank you, 1260, um, that changed it very slightly. So what it did was it, it tied the determination of negligence to the issuance of, and compliance with CAL FIRE permits. And so if you were in a time of year and in location where you got a CAL FIRE permit and then you complied with that permit, um, you could make what's called a prima facie showing um, of reasonableness. So essentially, it... it um, made the burden of proof a little bit easier for the prescribed burn community by essentially saying, the first thing you would do is you would hold up your permit, you would hold up what you did if you complied with the terms of your permit, then it's on the other side to prove that that was somehow unreasonable. And so it, it created just a little bit of a thumb on the scale in terms of finding that burners that were in compliance with their permits um, would likely not be held liable um, for either third party uh, damages or for suppression costs or investigation costs. Then we get to SB 332, um, which was passed two legislative cycles ago. Um, and, and initially, we were trying to change everything. Um, so the original bill language that we drafted was, was really intended to move to a gross negligence standard for all of those things that you could potentially have to pay for, for third party damages, suppression costs, investigations. Um, and we ran into some unfortunate roadblocks and needed to pivot and ended up going just for the suppression and investigation costs, essentially just the things that the public is paying for, excuse me, um, in this context, um, looking uh, to modify that particular standard. And so what SB 332 does is it sets out a list of criteria and says that if you're in compliance with those criteria, then you now have a gross negligence standard for suppression costs, investigations, et cetera, that sort of public response items. Gross negligence uh, is different from, um, from a simple negligence standard because it's not a comparison between you and a reasonable person. It's really looking, have you gone so outside the bounds of what is considered normal <laughs> that you are grossly negligent? Um, and so if you consider sort of like error bars, then um, a gross, sorry, my phone keeps ringing. Um, gross negligence is that you're like outside the error bars on what anyone would have done. Um, and most likely you're going to find it when you are doing things um, like ha showing no due care, not having a burn plan, just like lighting things on fire in your backyard. It's a much harder standard to meet. Um, and so that is the change for, uh, for suppression and investigation costs that came with 332. 332, just to be clear, did not change the situation for third party damages. We are still in a mostly simple negligence scenario for third party damages. Um, that, that is the, the lay of the land here. May, someday, Lenya, we're going to do it. I don't know when, <laughs> but that, that's the situation right now. Um, and then the one little wrinkle that I wanted to highlight in here, which ties to a little bit of the question is like, well, whose suppression costs? Whose suppression costs are covered by SB 332? The, the, because it's state law, it's really directed at state and um, contract agencies. So it's very clear that SB 332 applies to suppression costs incurred by CAL FIRE or by other fire districts in the state of California. 
But what happens if you're adjacent to Forest Service land and the feds respond or adjacent to BLM land? And the case, that case is a little bit more complicated, although SB 332 still helps us. So in what happens with federal suppression costs is there is no federal suppression standard. There's no federal law that you could look up in the US code and say, okay, this is the standard that the Forest Service applies. Instead, what the Forest Service does is it looks to the laws of the state that they are in and they apply that negligence standard from the state that they are in. Um, so in almost all scenarios, what we would expect to see is that the uh, Forest Service or other federal response agency would look to SB 332 and apply that same thing um, to determine liability for suppression costs that they incurred. There is a slight wrinkle caveat out for them that says if doing so is counter to public policy, they don't have to do it and they can come up with their own standard. Um, we have had conversations with uh, folks in the Forest Service who have said, but are unwilling to put in writing that they would just apply 332, um, but we don't have anything firm to point to. So I think you should feel pretty safe in that scenario, but not um, entirely uh, covered with that. So that is the state of liability law in California right now. Awesome. That was um, perfect, Sarah. Thank you for that. And I get you pretty much, you know, we got a question from Jared um, it, through email earlier today that got at that question of, of the federal fire response and cost recovery from the Forest Service or other federal agencies. So I think we pretty much covered that. His question was a little different, just in the sense that he asked if the feds, um, if the state would actually reimburse the federal agencies for, for fire suppression costs. And um, I emailed him back and said, no. <laughs> um, so I think that, does that, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, two more thoughts on that. One is, no, unless we end up with that being covered by the claims fund, I don't think we're going to, but if for some reason that is covered, that could be one route towards reimbursement. We oh, should God. talk about that later. <laughs> <laughs> um, the one other thing I want to say about the federal policy, though, is this is an area where there has been submission into the Biden Wildfire Commission for encouragement that we would change the federal laws and actually say across the board for service or other agency suppression costs are should be a gross negligence standard. That would take an act of Congress. Um, and I'm not sure whether that will emerge as a final recommendation out of the Biden Wildfire Commission, but that is certainly, um, it has been submitted and, and is being discussed. Yeah, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up, Sarah, because I, um, I think that is important that I was telling someone that that's something that we've talked a lot about and that, our, that we, Sarah and I are part of like a policy work group that works at the state level, but then also on some federal issues. And that's definitely one of the things that we brought forward. And um, Ryan Tompkins is on this call right now. And he and I have talked not only about um, federal fire suppression costs, but also about that piece on ecological damages that the Forest Service, if you have a burn that escapes onto Forest Service land, they could charge you not only for suppression costs, but also for damages um, to their property. And so that's another piece that needs to be changed, right? It's not, um, it, it, that's a major disincentive, especially for all you folks who live in an area adjacent to federal land. So that is on our radar and we are working on that at the federal level. And we do have a lot of friends in the in the Biden commission, um, people who are like actively involved and serving on that, who are listening to these ideas. So who knows where those will go, but, um, but I'm glad that you brought that up, Sarah. Yeah. And just to answer um, Hannah's question in the chat. Um, yes, so one of the criteria um, in which that is applied to determine whether you get that gross negligence standard is you have to, um, non-cultural burners need to have a, a burn plan and it needs to be reviewed and approved by a, um, a California uh, burn, uh, certified burn boss. We'll talk in a little bit about changes to that <laughs> potentially, um, but that is the current law. Uh, cultural burners don't need to comply with either of those, um, cultural yeah. practitioners don't need to comply with either of those requirements. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And that's something that people have been confused about. The The burns in order to have that gross negligence standard do not have to be led by a state certified burn boss. They just have to have had a burn plan reviewed and approved. Um, let's see. So does the existence of a CFFA um, 
influence whether the state will reimburse the Forest Service for suppression costs. I don't know what that acronym stands for, Jared. Can you? It, it, yes. That's a contract. It's a, it's a um, community fire assistance agreement. So uh, essentially, we're, we're working on a private pos uh, parcel, which is state responsibility era, uh -huh. uh, area, but um, the CAL FIRE has, has an agreement with the Forest Service, whose fire station is uh -huh. much closer to this um, uh, fire station that the Forest Service would be the first responder. Got uh, it. So... Yeah. yeah, depends on the terms of that agreement. Um, I would assume that Cal Fire reimburses them to respond. And so um, in that instance, then the path to, to like determining which rules you apply and who is going to seek contribution from you is going to be dependent on that contract. I don't know the, the general rules, though. Right. Right. It right. could be that right. Cal Fire reimburses the Forest Service and then makes that determination whether or not to go after you for cost recovery. Exactly. Yeah. That's what I would envision it being <laughs> um, based on other contractors, like these kind of direct protection swaps, but um, I don't know the specifics for yours. Yeah. Right. Great. Thanks. Great. Okay. Um, so unless there are other questions about these pieces, about Senate Bill 332 um, or about that federal piece, then I'd like Sarah to talk a little bit about the prescribed fire claims fund um, that was kind of pushed forced into action with um senate bill 926 last year and oh yeah so tara is asking a little more about cultural practitioners um with sure. in our yeah so we can talk a little bit more about how that pertains to senate bill 332 and then we'll also go more in depth on some cultural fire issues a little farther down in the agenda but yeah sarah do you want to um yeah just lay out how that works for 332 yeah so i mean in 332 the um requirements that you need to meet and again this off the top of my head is that you need to have um a written burn plan approved and reviewed by a california certified burn boss you need to comply with that plan. You need to get your any required CAL FIRE permits, any required smoke permits. You need to have permission with the landowner and you can't act in a grossly negligent manner. Um, that That is the requirements. For cultural practitioners, um, you do not need to have a written burn plan and it does not need to be reviewed or approved by anyone. So, um, and therefore you don't need to have compliance with that burn plan. You still need to go through the rest of it. Um, I'm gonna put a pin in, the new legislation that we're looking at, which will change some of that, hopefully will change some of that for cultural fire practitioners. Yeah, and if you look at the language of Senate Bill 332, it's it's not one of those bills that's like 100 pages long and hard to read. It's really straightforward. So I recommend just um, maybe someone could pop that in the chat or I can when I'm not talking, but it's pretty clearly laid out there, um, which is nice. So yeah, let's... Um, Okay, you're wondering if cultural practitioners easily challenge the term. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you want to speak to that, Sarah? Yeah, this is a complicated area. So um, as I'm sure many of you are aware, we have a variety of Native American and Indigenous folks um, in California that have very different relationships with their tribe or tribal organization or tribal entity. We have both federally recognized tribes, we have non-federally recognized tribes, and then we have folks that are not affiliated with either that may be affiliated with a tribal band or, or family band or other community. And so when we were coming up with a definition of what is a cultural fire practitioner, we were trying to be as broadly inclusive as possible um, to ensure that we weren't just limiting the protections in SB 332 to folks that had sort of formal recognition through a federally recognized tribe or a state recognized tribe, for instance. Um, and so you will see the language, Delphine pops it into the chat, which is very helpful. It's in there that defines cultural fire practitioner and it essentially requires someone that is um, in some way <laughs> associated or affiliated with a tribe, tribal organization or tribal entity, but does not require any sort of formal determination. This, of course, leads to questions, right, as to who gets to decide that they're a cultural fire practitioner and who um, controls that sort of determination. Um, we don't know how it would be tested in the courts or if Cal Fire tried to seek suppression costs for someone, say, for instance, that met all the other requirements but didn't have a burn plan and said they were a cultural fire practitioner. 
Um, so sort of to be determined, but I think what we were really trying to avoid was a scenario where the state was defining who was a cultural fire practitioner and had some role in determining, are you indigenous enough to get this qualification? So hopefully that answers your question, Tara. Tara, Tara, I don't know. Great, great. Thanks, Sarah. Um, let's talk, so why don't you go ahead and talk a little bit about the claims fund and kind of where we are with that and <laughs> yeah. Try to contain my rage. <laughs> it's <laughs> rage, but um, so, um, so as many of you probably know, two cycles ago, the state legislature set aside $20 million to establish a um, prescribed fire claims fund that was intended to do a couple of things. Um, at the broadest level, it's intended to incentivize more folks to use prescribed fire and cultural burning. Um, at sort of a more granular level, it's attempting to both provide um, assurance to folks that are engaged in this work, to the general public who may be harmed if there's an inadvertent escape, and to um, insurance companies who were hoping to incentivize back into the market or to incentivize lower premiums than what we're currently seeing. Um, so that happened two cycles ago. Last cycle, we got SB 926, which was um, sponsored by the Nature Conservancy. I know we have some folks from TNC on the line. It was um, definitely a politicized process. Um, TNC had language originally, then Cal Fire, who was tasked with running the claims fund, got involved, and we ended up with sort of a, I would say, a medium compromise bill um, that set it up. And the so the claims fund um, is scheduled, this is the great news, scheduled to be up and running in March. I think there's some skepticism about whether we will get there, but Cal Fire seems pretty committed to making that happen. Um, and so Lenya and I, I don't know if anyone else on this call, um, but Lenya and I have been involved in the in a stakeholder group that Cal Fire has convened to set out the parameters of what the claims fund will cover and how exactly it will work. And I think the good news has been is that Cal Fire has been pretty receptive to most of the direction that, that has been uh, provided in that setting. Um, there are a lot of wrinkles to setting this up uh, that we have spun ourselves in circles over <laughs> um, in some ways. And so we'll see how exactly it's um, going to shape up. But the general overview that I think we're seeing emerge right now is that um, there is going to be some limitation on the number of reservation or number of slots available. The number that's being floated right now is 200, although Cal Fire is thinking if we get a lot of risk, a lot of interest um, that it might increase that. That will be for each um, burn plan. So one reservation equals one burn plan. Um, we're trying to figure out ways of making sure that reservations can be made sort of in advance and provide certainty to the prescribed burn community that you have coverage in the claims fund if you actually end up burning, while also balancing the fact that we don't want to have people just sitting on reservations, not using them, and taking up um, spots that might otherwise go used. So we're trying to figure out what that system will look like exactly. Um, we're focusing it predominantly on broadcast burns or broadcast burns that includes may include some piles. We're trying to, there will be some coverage likely for pile burns, but it's sort of a smaller sliver. We're a little bit worried about um, folks with pile burns uh, coming in and taking all the slots. And so we wanna really encourage broadcast burning. Um, the claims fund is going to broad, likely broadly cover um, third party losses. So this is gonna be the complement to SB 332 and that it's really focused on covering damages to third parties, potentially damages to the prescribed burn um, community. Uh, if for instance, the example we were talking about most recently is like, if you have an escape and it burns a vehicle that was parked outside of the burn area, like you might get coverage for that. We're still working on that. Um, and uh, let's see, what else can I tell you about it? I mean, I think we're really excited to get it off the ground. The other thing that I um, want to note too is this is very much going to be a pilot and there will be opportunities to adjust it if it doesn't work the way we intend in the first instance. Um, oh, I know one other thing I was going to say. It covers $2 million per incident um, and it's first line coverage, meaning that if you... Uh, if you have other insurance available or self-insurance, 
this will be the first thing in line. And then, so we're hoping that will incentivize insurers back into the market. We understand that the insurance um, industry is more comfortable providing coverage in sort of an umbrella type fashion for um, losses that are higher than that, but we'll see. Oh, yeah, we're, we're, yeah, we're getting some good questions <clears throat> in the chat. So Chris um, Adlam up in Oregon asked, why are there limited spots? And was that part of the compromise? So I just typed a little answer in there because there's limited money and we don't want to overpromise coverage. Um, but yeah, it's been an interesting thing. And Sarah and I really pushed on this because originally the conversation was looking like they only wanted, you know, we have $20 million, 10% off the top for admin, that's $18 million, um, $2 million max coverage per project. So the original conversations were that they would have nine slots at $2 million a apiece. Um, and we really pushed on that because we know the rates of damage are so low that there is virtually no possibility that, that we'd you know, exceed the fund. Um, so I'd say that was one of our big wins was that Sarah and I crunched some like ran, like some numbers and proposed 200 just as a starting point. And um, and they were like, OK, sure. It was <laughs> it was one of these like surprises and the flexibility. So, um, yeah, so that's why that piece is there. So, um, yeah, go ahead, Sarah. Yeah. So to answer a couple of the questions that are coming yeah. in. So on the um, question, can a PBA reserve one to two reservation spots and rotate through burn plans if you are like, you know, planning a lot of activities and you don't quite know what you're going to do? The tentative plan is yes, um, that you will be able to sort of swap out your reservations. If it turns out that the one you've reserved for isn't a go, you can use your slot for another one that is a go. Um, can so I add something there too, Sarah? One of the other things that um, that we're looking at for this is really trying to encourage like regional burn plans. So someone like Will Harling in the Mid Klamath, they have um, they have big burn plans that have a lot of different units in them and cover you know a lot of different projects within one single burn plan. So that would be a way of doing it too. So Wolfie, I don't know if that's something that you all are looking at, but it could be a potential option, um, especially with the way that this bill was written, that you could have coverage for a lot of projects under a single master burn plan. Um, and I think we should also note that like all the information that Sarah and I are sharing right now is very preliminary and not official. And this is just coming out of this working group that we've been part of. Very little of this has, has been put in writing, which is one of the frustrations that, that Sarah and I have about it. Um, so take it all with a grain of salt. I mean, th this is what the conversations are, but this is not formalized yet. So um, yeah. yeah, don't hold us accountable if at the end of the day, Cal Fire comes back with something terrible. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So we'll try. <laughs> we're doing yeah, our we're best. trying our best. But, and so we're giving you our best information as of our call yesterday with this working group. But um, so does it cover damages after the burn or just the day of? Um, so the, the tentative plan is it will cover damages. I think going 60 days out is the the metric that we're working with. We're trying to balance um, like how long you have to keep your quote reservation available after you've completed a burn um, with the fact that certainly we know of examples where, where burns have reignited after some period of time. And so um, so say, for instance, you complete a burn, everything's good, you say, you know, the fire's contained and extinguished and, and we're ready to go, and then four days later something rekindles and burns down a neighbor's barn, you would have coverage for that, that um, uh, accidental rekindling. So it's not, it might not last, like, who knows if Calf Canyon had happened, like if that would be covered in this scenario, um, but certainly ones that are more of a shorter time frame should be covered afterwards. Yeah. And then who's eligible to make the reservation? Yeah, so it is anyone that is doing a burn that is um, led by a cultural fire practitioner or burn boss. And in this context, burn boss could be either a state certified burn boss or someone with NWCG quals. Um, so we have a little bit broader coverage there. Um, the burn also needs to be for like the intent of the bill, which is really um, for ecological, cultural, uh, community protection, fuel reduction related purposes. Um, for instance, uh, things that are like purely ag burning are unlikely to be covered um, through this. Am I missing anything else about eligibility? 
I don't think so. I think one of the questions that came up on our working group call yesterday, and Sarah, this might have been after you jumped off, um, was that it could be a, like that the burn has to be led by a burn boss or cultural practitioner um, and that, that someone could reserve kind of knowing that they have that person lined up. And then we ended yesterday talking about, well, maybe the reservation actually has to be made by the burn boss or cultural practitioner. So I think those are two different things. And that'll be kind of interesting to see how that pans out because you could have an organization that's reserving, like Wolfie could be reserving, making the reservation, knowing that she has a burn boss lined up. Um, but that's not really where we ended the conversation yesterday. So I think that remains to be seen. Um, and then Lindsay's asking, would timber operation burning, um, landing piles, broadcast burning for reforestation be eligible? Yeah, so I think certainly broadcast burns for reforestation would be eligible. Piles will also likely be eligible, but with a more limited number of slots. And I would say that that is a particular place where the claim, where like the, the folks that are going to review this after we get some data back are looking like it, whether the piles should be covered or not. So Tentative, yes, but in this more limited capacity. Um, and Wolfie, yes. So to be eligible, it needs to be led by a burn boss. This is the this is what we lost in our compromise with Cal Fire. We were looking at something that did not have such a stringent requirement for burn bosses, but at the end of the day, um, Cal Fire is requiring um, burn bosses or cultural fire practitioners um, to lead the burns. Um, the other things that you have to have to be eligible um, ultimately are going to be uh, both your smoke management permits and then CAL FIRE permits if necessary. You also will need to have a, quote, burn plan approved by CAL FIRE, even if you don't need CAL FIRE permits. We've been concerned that that was going to be a lengthy and um, uh, uh, discretionary process by CAL FIRE where they were trying to essentially shoehorn like make everyone get burn permits. It does not seem like that is the direction they are going in. It's mostly that they're have going to require some short burn plan. It might even be just a page to check off whether this is the type of activity that is eligible for the fund, as opposed to making any sort of determination as to like the safety um, or the like specifics of, of how the burn plan is going to be operated. Yeah, and those pieces would still be vetted through the permit process if you were during a time of year where you needed a permit. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we're feeling a little better about that burn plan piece. Yeah. How would you apply for a reservation? Would you apply to the state or go through local BC when applying for permits? I think it's going to be an online survey. Yeah. Um, they have, we've seen the interface. It looks nice and user-friendly. Um, and my understanding is what happens on the back end is it's, I think it's going to go to Len and like, Let's <laughs> underling and they're going to look at it and and then it will be approved. So it's done um, sort of at the state level as opposed to at the local level, at least for this sort of initial pilot period. Yeah, and it'll be separate from applying for permits. It'll be a separate process. Um, great. More questions on the claims fund before we shift gears? And I guess I will say too that I'm sure we will have something in writing hopefully soon, <laughs> which we then can share out for with everyone. Um, you know, I think that you want to be thinking that this is probably going to go live, I would guess, at the earliest by end of March. And like, it might be that there's a lot of interest and we have, you know, we hit sort of the, the 200 reservation cap relatively soon. So be thinking about it. I'm sure when Lenya sends out her email saying that it's going to be open, pay attention to it and actually sign up. Um, yeah, great. Okay, Susie, a uh, sort of related question. How many California state certified burn bosses do we have now? My last update, which is a, a week old, um, was that we have 12. So I will say that, um, like, I've now hosted the class three times. I think I've had a total of like 62 people move through that course. Um, and what I've been seeing in the in the last couple months is that Cal Fire is processing the paperwork a lot faster than they were before. So I have some of you on this call are sitting on your task books or maybe you're having imposter syndrome and waiting to send it in so you don't feel qualified. Um, get them in, you know, get, get certified. Even if you're not going to use it to lead burns, like maybe you're not comfortable with that yet, but you might be able to help with burn plan review and approval that's going to really, you know, help your community, help your PBA. So I really encourage doing that. Um, will there be some sort of directory where we can find a burn boss? 
That's a good question. Um, I try to keep a list. Um, I will say that I have requested that from state fire training because I wanted them to like kind of give me reports on that. Um, and they said I'd have to do it as a, a formal request. Um, what do you call that? Like a public yeah, record, request. A public record request. And I'm like, I'm the one who's hosting the classes. Why would I have to do that? So, so I don't know about that. I mean, I think it could be something that we could host on our Cal PBA website and that people who want to be listed could just opt into that. So that's something that um, I've been thinking about is like, maybe we just go more of an informal route because there will be some people who become certified who don't want to be listed and don't want to be contacted and um, and then others who are going to be more available. So I think we'll probably have to kind of make that happen at the grassroots level. But yeah, I think we're only at 12, but I'm hopeful that other folks are, are gonna get their stuff in and um, and become certified. Because so I think CAL FIRE is like ready to, to move that forward. We're not, they're not dragging their feet like they were a year ago on this. So um, great. Any other questions on burn boss stuff or on, on the claims fund before we move on? Um, one other thing that I will just briefly yeah. mention is that this is another piece of federal policy that is like yes. in discussion um, is whether and how we might set up a similar entity at a national level. Um, there are certainly folks that are paying attention to what California is doing and saying, couldn't we do this at a broader level, have a bigger pool of funding? spread the risk out even more. So no, nothing firm on that, but but do you want you all to know that that is part of the sort of national conversation too? Yeah, that's great. Okay, well, I'm thinking actually, let's, um, let's transition into talking a little more about cultural burning and talk about Senate Bill 310 and about that question that Lindsay had about what kind of progress is being made for burning on tribal trust lands. Um, so do you want to, do you want to dig into that a little yes. bit? So let me cover SB 310 first, and then okay. I will switch to the federal side of things. Um, so one of the things that SB 332 did is it created these exceptions for cultural fire practitioners for burn plans. It did not create an explicit exception for permits. And so um, tribes and cultural fire practitioners that want to use SB 332 um, still need to go through the process if it's in the, the time of year to get a CAL FIRE permit um, in order to take advantage of that change in liability standard and may potentially need an error district permit as well. Um, I know some tribes have sort of informal agreements with air districts to not require that, but certainly not universal. Um, and so there is concern, was concern in the cultural fire practitioner community that that we sort of left it incomplete, right? That we um, had started the work of segregating out cultural fire practitioners and having their um, work be more in line with tribal law or natural law, but we hadn't quite finished it. And so um, SB 310, which is sponsored by the Creek Tribe, is um, just, it was just introduced on Monday. Um, and so like <laughs> hot off the press. Um, and what it does is it essentially recognizes tribal sovereignty over cultural fire practices. And it does this in a, um, in a particular way. It essentially says that if a tribe has a tribal law that, a, that covers approval of cultural burns, and that could be an ordinance, that could be a resolution, that could be a specific agreement, that could be sort of anything in the scope of how tribes uh, govern their own affairs. If there is such approval, uh, an approval process and that approval is given, then the cultural fire practitioner does not need to separately get CAL FIRE permits, air district permits, and they can burn during times when CAL FIRE shuts burning down. So they are excused from all of those requirements um, in recognition that the tribe has provided its own set of requirements. Um, this would apply not just on reservation land or trust land, but anywhere within a tribe's ancestral territory. And that term is defined to be the um, geographic location that the tribe establishes itself having jurisdiction over in its own constitution. So it has to be written down, it has to be in a document somewhere, but it's for the tribe to determine what the geographic bounds of this authority is. Um, 
And so this, yeah, this said, introduced by Senate, Senator Dodd um, on Monday, sponsored by the Kruk tribe. You know, uh, lots of conversations about this as well, as I talked about earlier, trying to both recognize that, um, like, who Indigenous and Native American people are can be complicated um, in, Calif in California, and that we might have um, folks that are not parts of uh, federally recognized or state recognized tribes. Um, th this bill, nevertheless, takes the approach of um, essentially recognizing tribal sovereignty as opposed to an individual indigenous sovereignty. So it, it still is based on a governance structure within a tribe, as opposed to a self-determination by an individual that they are um, eligible to burn. So it, it recognizes a tribal process rather than an individual right. Um, and there, you know, lots of conversation about that and whether that's the right approach or not. I will say that it is, um, uh, I think, probably the only path towards approval right now because Cal Fire and, and the state are really looking to, is there someone else that is making sure these burns are safe? Who, who is going to be responsible for them? And when you start looking at it being an individual right, you don't have that sort of oversight that the state really wants to see. So that's the direction the bill goes in. Really exciting. I mean, this would be one of the first recogni recognitions of tribal sovereignty over these kinds of practices, I think anywhere in the country. And so we're certainly looking for support. And I think, Lenny, you, you're probably gonna send out an email yeah. shortly asking for that. Um, yeah. And so uh, the question that Lindsay asked, does this apply on federal land? Um, unfortunately, no, because it, um, Federal land is not governed by um, state, like you don't need to get a CAL FIRE permit to burn on federal land. So having an excuse to not get CAL FIRE permits doesn't help you. You still need to get <laughs> approval from the feds to do it. Um, I'll talk in a second to about other federal stuff that's happening um, in the cultural burning space. But this SB 310 does not address federal land. Um, and Wolfie, your question, no, the tribe does not need to be federally recognized to access SB 310. Um, they do need to be on the NAP list, so meaning their state, that, that's the Native American Heritage Commission list, and that's referred to a state-recognized tribe. Um, that process of getting state recognition is pretty um, open, and most tribal bands um, or entities in California are on that NAP list. So it, it's pretty wide in terms of the tribes that can access it. Um, yeah, and then the other thing that SB 310 does that I just want to briefly mention is it fixes the limitation in SB 332 um, to just being state certified burn bosses. So if this passes, uh, you would get that SB 332 coverage if you had your burn plan reviewed by a, an, an NWCG qualified burn boss as well. So we're looking to make that a little bit more expansive. Um, so yes, that is the uh, the update on that. Um, I feel like there was another question, though, that I'm now blanking on. <laughs> I don't. Oh, I know. BIA. Federal issues. Oh. Yeah. Okay. So um, on tribal trust land, um, there is a whole slew of federal, very paternalistic laws about what tribes are allowed to do um, on lands that are held in trust by the United States for the benefit of the tribe. Um, and essentially, well, I'll say what the law requires, and I'll explain a little bit about how there's maybe some nuance there. But essentially, under the National Indian Forest Management Act, um, tribes have to prepare forest management plans. These are very similar in some ways to the forest management plans that the Forest Service has to apply or has to has to um, prepare. And in fact, the um, this version of the bill is mimicked off the National Forest Management Act, and they. Um, so the tribe has to prepare a burn plan, like a, a, a forest management plan, get that approved by the Bureau of Indian Affairs before they can then implement a prescribed fire program on their own trust land. Um, they then, for each individual burn, also needs to get BIA approval. So you have to go get BIA approval twice in order to do, I'm going to use the term prescribed fire because that's like the, really this covers prescribed fire activities um, on tribal trust land. So it, and BIA is not helpful in this context. I have heard stories of BIA officers just sitting on proposals for like five to seven years. Um, and so essentially stalling out 
um, any tribal efforts to run like officially federally sanctioned programs on their own lands, which is, it's terrible. And so I think the question we had got, um, Lenya was about specifically like, why is it so dang hard to build on trust lands? We hear about tribes that because of that, like are, would much prefer to burn on private lands because the state process is that much smoother. And that's that's certainly the case. Um, I will, the caveat that I wanted to make and why I said it covered sort of prescribed fire is that there are certainly tribes that do cultural fire practitioners outside of the process I just talked about that have traditional application of cultural or ceremonial fire where they just don't get a BIA approval. Um, and that's certainly, I'm aware of that that happens. Um, whether you would ask the federal government that they should have gotten approval for it, I'm certain that the federal government would say yes. So, um, so let me pause there and see, Lindsay, you had a question? Yeah, Lindsay, go ahead. Yeah, from what I understand also, in addition to an FMP, they actually need a burn plan, an MWCG burn plan, and the burn needs to be led by an NWCG qualified burn boss and not, um, and it has to be a BIA burn boss unless there's a local cooperator, like in our district of the Mendocino, they have a cooperative agreement with, or an interagency agreement with BIA, so their NWCG burn bosses can burn on BIA land, um, federal trust land. But um, yeah, there's the FMP, NWCG burn plan, burn boss. And then I'm not sure if the whole org chart, I think the old whole org chart also has to be NWC qualified positions. Um, and in our region, there are like two people that can review burn plans and actually lead these burns. So it's like massively stymied our work in Lake County in a really frustrating way and a lot of people want to yeah I guess that's the next part you're going to get to is what yeah. things are happening on a federal level excited to hear about that yeah for sure and just to address Matthew's comment in the um uh chat in addition to everything that I talked about and Lindsay talked about then you also have the BIA as a federal agency has to do NEPA analysis for all of these plans um and they uh have to also comply with essentially Endangered Species Act, National Historic Preservation Act, the whole suite of federal laws in order to make their approvals. So it's a, it is a mess. Um, so what is happening on this? <laughs> well, there's a couple of um, uh, efforts being made um, to try and change this. I think it's an uphill battle, but it's one that needs to be addressed. So um, first, the, uh, Bill Tripp is on the, um, the Biden commission on this. And so certainly it has come up in that context. There's a subcommittee on tribal sovereignty issues and the BIA piece is, is one of the issues that that group is looking at. So there may be recommendations to Congress on this particular issue um, coming out of that. Um, and then the other thing that I'll just mention is I'm involved in a group um, called the Stewardship Project with uh, Don Hankins, who is a, um, a cultural fire practitioner, uh, uh, Plains Miwok uh, individual here in California. And then Scott Stevens, who runs the Fire Lab at Berkeley, um, that we're working on uh, federal policy goals and advancements. And this is one of the other items that we are focused on as well. So there's a couple of different like routes coming together. Uh, we're, we're talking with the Intertribal Timber Council, which is like one of the big um, Indian like lobbying arms um, and has they have quite a bit of sway at the federal level. And so they've been in conversations with us about whether to, and how to advance this goal. So, so I'll say we're fo we're focused on it, but oh man, it is it is such a problem. <laughs> so, there's that. Great. Yeah, and Lindsay, I think you and I should c connect. <laughs> um, so, uh, I'll pop my email into the chat, but send me an email because I would love to to help garner support on this one. Yeah, I was going to suggest that too, because Lindsay sent me a great little document that they've put together with policy ideas and stuff. So I think that's a good, you guys should definitely connect. Um, other questions on Senate Bill 310 or on any of the issues that Sarah brought up or on other issues related to cultural burning? Anyone? Okay. Okay. Um, well, let's move on. There was a question kind of shifting gears. There was a question from Matthew Shapiro who couldn't join us today, but sent it in and was hoping we could um, 
we could touch base about some issues related to permits and to CEQA. Yeah. And he's having yeah, issues. Jeff, you want to let Tara go? Oh, first. sure. Yeah, go ahead. Tara or Tara, um, do you have something related to the cultural fire before we switch gears? We can't hear you if you're talking. There you go. Can you hear me? Yes, you are. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Um, so I just wanted to ask, you know, so we we are a tribe, we have a cultural fire program, but we also partner in particular on a project in collaboration. It's on its county land in collaboration with our local conservancy. So there's like this trifecta happening to get fire on the land between all of us. And I'm just wondering if you know, if those cultural practitioner stipulations apply in this case, or if it is a collaboration, do we really need to tick all the boxes or? Yeah, so the way that SB 332 works is that it just needs, it needs to be led by a cultural fire practitioner. So mm -hmm. I think you could even be in a scenario where, um, you know, you could have a co-leadership or something like that, but as long as you have a cultural fire practitioner that is in the leadership role, you should be covered without needing to comply with the other things, even if you're burning with other folks in your collaborative. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Sarah. Any other questions on that that are coming up for folks? I think we're doing great on time. So if you, if something's brewing, let me know. Um, we can also come back to this if something if something comes up later. Um, okay, so back to the question from Matthew Shapiro. So Matthew emailed from the, well, I like to call it Southern California. People would call it the Central Coast. And he was curious because he's having issues getting permits um, from, he's in a contract county. But he had some um, kind of information from his local permitting person that the issuance of an LE7 could trigger CEQA. And so this is something we've heard before. Um, but Sarah, do you want to speak to that and yeah, sure. dispel any rumors? Yeah, um, to the extent I can. So um, first, just a little bit about what CEQA is and what it covers, because that will help answer this question. So California Environmental Quality Act covers all discretionary actions taken by public agencies in California. Um, essentially, if an agency has the authority to um, uh, control the terms and if and when if and whether to um, issue a permit, then that is technically considered discretionary and they are supposed to comply with CEQA. Um, if you need to comply with CEQA, then you need to go through an entire process of determining first, like potentially there's an exemption that applies, but then you still need to do paperwork to document your exemption. Or if there's not an exemption, then you need to go through what's called an initial study and determine may there be significant impacts from my action. And if so, then you need to prepare either um, an environmental impact report, or if uh, you can mitigate those impacts, you can prepare what's called a mitigated negative declaration. So lots of paperwork if CEQA applies. Um, and uh, Lindsay, I'll, I'll address that question in a second. Um, but on um, just the issuance of CAL FIRE permits alone, so just the question of you go in, you want a burn permit, and CAL FIRE needs to issue them. CAL FIRE has said in a PowerPoint, but still I, I have it saved and we'll hold them to it, <laughs> that issuance of uh, burn plant burn permits is a ministerial process that is the opposite of discretionary it means that it is um, they are supposed to be essentially checking boxes and if you meet all the boxes then you get your permit we know that that is not necessarily how all cal fire units are applying it but that is what cal the official word is from cal fire the issuance of burn permits is ministerial and therefore CEQA does not apply um, and so that means that there is no need for them to do an exemption or anything else when the only issue at play is whether they are they're issuing the permits. I think you can use this to your advantage uh, when people are holding up permits because CalFire doesn't want to have to comply with CEQA uh, in doing this. No one wants them to have to do that because we'll never get permits again. Um, but so reminding them that this is supposed to be a ministerial decision, um, meaning that you have a right to get that permit as long as you meet the conditions. So. Um, and if anyone wants that PowerPoint, I'm certainly happy to send it. It's like buried in there, but it is there. Um, 
And then the question that Lindsay asked is, are there examples of countywide CEQA for prescribed fire to speed up the process? So, um, so the uh, countywide exemption could go through what's called, well, first off, when would you need to do CEQA in this context? So it's not gonna be for getting your Cal Fire permits and it's not gonna be for getting your smoke permits. Those are the same, same also a ministerial process. It's really going to come up if you have a public agency that is in, directly involved in doing the project. So potentially if you have an RCD or other county that it, um, like um, a public agency that's meeting the burn or has to make decisions about the burn, they might need to do CEQA for their involvement. And potentially if you have um, the uh, some grant funds will require that you need to do or the agency providing the grant funds needs to do CEQA compliance before they do that for to support a specific project. Um, in those contexts where CEQA is required, the state embarked in a massive effort called the California um, Vegetation Treatment Plan Programmatic Environmental Impact Statement, which is a statewide effort at doing like sort of programmatic top tier level CEQA um, for prescribed fire, but also for vegetation management of other types, um, mechanical thinning, uh, um, uh, fuel breaks, um, some like herbivory and grazing activities. Um, and what the VTP does is it lays out a process for how either at a countywide level or at an individual project level, you could potentially do some streamlining. I don't love the VTP. I actually think in some ways it overcomplicates things that could be done more simply. Um, but if you are looking for a, more, for a solution to what is a more complex problem, um, it is the way to go. And so it, it has all these appendices that sort of explain how to do, for instance, let's say if you wanted to do a countywide CEQA for prescribed fire and then just be done with it forever, the VTP would be the mechanism to do that. Um, okay, so that, that's my answer for that. And then I'm seeing, I've been told by California Fish and Wildlife that if there's an endangered species in an area to be burned, you would need to go to them for a permit. Yes, potentially that that is that is the case. Um, it, it, you can't ca you can't cause take of endangered species, and so you. But there's some nuance there, and I that is one area that I'm not able to speak of like off the top of my head. So if you have specific questions, we can talk about that one. Um, there's someone else in my office that does our ESA compliance stuff. So. And then Jared also pointed out that hmm, CEQA would be required if you had public funding, you know, if you had state funding for a project, which is definitely true and probably even bigger issue than um, than the state agency as lead. Um, okay, Allison has a question, but first, Lindsay, uh, your hand is up. So let's go to Lindsay and then we'll go to the questions in the chat. Thank you, Lena. And yeah, thank you, Sarah, for all this info. It's, it's, it's excellent. Um, I just wanted to put in a little bit of a note about the Cal VTP. I mean, I agree with you. I don't love it. We just embarked on a Cal VTP for a large project area outside of Mount Shasta here in Siskiyou County. And it covers almost 13,000 acres. Um, and, you know, we included the manual and mechanical thinning, but um, a big part of it was just to blanket that coverage for prescribed fire. Um, but as we were going through the process and um and the, the specific project requirements that you you plug into there i just want to put out a cautionary note to um the pba community about those because um you know this was developed by the board of forestry and cal fire and there are some administrative requirements that they um, have as sprs in there for prescribed fire activities requiring um, some pretty um, some pretty uh, stringent things in terms of implementing burning, like like all non Cal Fire personnel. And this is in the quote. This is off the top of my head, but it says something like, "Not all non Cal Fire personnel um, conducting burns must follow all Cal Fire safety procedures." Um, and so that was a really big red flag for me because you know we're trying to do these burns PBA style, and that it's you know a huge impediment. So one thing you can do with the VTP is um, create an addendum to your project specific analysis and revise some of those um, some of those SPRs 
uh, that are not feasible for the, your implementation. And so I just wanted to um, just kind of put that out there and I'll put a link in the, the chat to, um, to the, the site that CAL FIRE has all of the approved, um, what they call PSAs, you know, the project specific analyses under the VTP and ours is the West Mount Shasta Forest Resiliency Project. It's number 35 on there. So if um, you want like so an example of, you know, how we adjusted the language to try to make it more flexible to include prescribed burning, um, please uh, feel free to use that as a resource. That's great. Thanks, Lindsay. And yeah, it's the Cal Fire was really worried about getting sued over the VTP. And so what they did is they just made it extremely comprehensive. So instead of it being like a true streamlining bill, it's instead they put all like all possible mitigation measures you now have to attempt to comply with or document why you don't need to. And so um it is it's a challenge. So uh Devin. Yeah, I just I have more of a comment, just kind of um, giving an opposite scenario that uh, Matthew's dealing with down in Santa Barbara. Um, recently, our uh, unit chief has um, made it possible that Cal Fire can support private burners to prescribe fires that are and not be subject to CEQA if those Cal Fire units are not in the minimum requirements. Um, so I actually did a burn this fall where Cal Fire brought out engines um, to support us. Um, and we didn't go through the sequel process. So just putting it out there that um, there can be a lot of change inside of your um, battalion units. Um, and there is there is hope that Cal Fire can, can kind of turn it around. Yeah, definitely unit by unit and lots of variability. I mean, the other thing too, um, just on getting Cal Fire involved with your burns that you know, I keep hoping to see more of going back to the liability side is like they have the authority now to be able to, if Cal Fire reviews your burn plan, shows up with contingency resources or is involved more directly to share liability with you. And, you know, we've heard from sort of the top down that they want to see more of that, even if Cal Fire is not in the lead role. So if you have, if you're in conversations with Cal Fire, remind your unit folks of that. <laughs> and if you run into pushback about them saying, oh no, we don't wanna take on liability. I think let me and Lenya know, <laughs> we'll try and run it up the ladder. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say is, um, I think it's been really helpful. Like some of you have reached out to me about various issues you're having. And I think it's been good. Like last week I gave a um, presentation for CAL FIRE's burn boss class. So for the burn bosses, they're training within CAL FIRE. And um, I was able to speak to some of the permitting issues in the different units and just encourage them to not do that. You know, don't be obstructionist. Like we're all working together. I think it was really effective, but it's nice to have those examples. And on the flip side of that, um, like Lindsay Daly has had a lot of great success with their Cal Fire unit. And so we actually, um, Aaron Banwell and um, Lindsay put together like a letter that really highlighted how great the Lake County Cal Fire folks have been. And we, I, I sent that to Joe Tyler, to the director of Cal Fire. And um, so I think let's, let's like, let's do that. Let's make sure to highlight where we're doing, where they're doing well, and then also keep track of where they're not doing well and be able to have a unified voice around that. Because I talk a lot with Cal Fire leadership. So I think it's really important to, to just keep that flow of information. So feel free to call me or, you know, tell me anytime. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on in the chat. There's also Delphine, I don't know if you saw my message, but someone's waiting in the, um, in the waiting room. Oh, okay. Yeah. If you could let them in, that would be awesome. Um, so were there other things in the chat that needed to be addressed? It seems like mostly like comments and people sharing documents and things like that. Allison, you asked the question about CEQA on educational stuff. I think you know, it's a pretty easy answer of no, um, no CEQA required there. So anything else on the CEQA piece before, because I do want to move on. Um, we don't, we have 23 minutes left. I want to make sure to talk about the PM 2.5 stuff. Um, so any other questions before we switch topics? Okay. Okay. 
Sarah, do you want to tell us what's going on at the federal level with all this PM 2.5 business? Yes. So apologies because like, is I know liability is hard, but now we're going to talk about the Clean Air Act, which is like <laughs> even worse. So I will do my best and attempt to not use acronyms, but it's just, they're just everywhere in this world. So um, on January 6th, the Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, announced that they are they issued a proposed rule um, on the regulation of fine particulate matter, which is also known as um, PM 2.5. And specifically, it's related to how they establish the National Ambient Air Quality Standards, also known as NACs, um, for uh, these types of pollution. And just to start out like with the important point that PM pollution is like one of the leading causes of environmental related health hazards and mortality in the United States. It is a really significant issue, particularly in low income and um, uh, black and brown communities. And so like, I, I am not gonna minimize that at all. It is a really important issue that, that um, EPA has had in its sights for some time. Um, so the, under the Trump administration, um, unsurprisingly, they, they had a, uh, every five years this has to be reevaluated, and they looked at the PM 2.5 um, levels that were set across the, the country, and the Trump administration said, nope, no need to change those, those look great. <laughs> and uh, when the Biden administration came in, it was one of their like day one priorities. So the environmental justice and public health communities had been asking the Biden administration to put this as a, a really high level priority to reevaluate the particulate matter standards. And so we've known for some time that the Biden administration was going to do this. They, they like immediately said this was part of their planning efforts and started the process of doing the sort of regulatory analysis that needs to happen. Um, and on January 6th, they announced that they intended to do so. Um, the January 6th announcement was a mixed bag in some ways. So the initial analysis that they the EPA had put out was they said they were looking at two different standards. One is the average annual standard for particulate matter, and one is the 24-hour standard. So just a little bit about how air quality is regulated in this country. Um, what we have is a system of air quality monitors that pick up on how much pollution is in the air. Um, and then those are compared to these National Ambient Air Quality Standards, or the NACs. And if you have an exceedance, like something that goes above what is measured, um, or a violation, which is like, it's defined in different ways, but it's usually that you have a number of exceedances over a certain period of time, um, then there are consequences for states um, and how they, and they're essentially tasked or told they have to, or have fines imposed on them if they don't, um, fix the air quality problems. And so for particulate matter, we have a standard that looks at how much particulate matter you are getting across the course of a year. That is the average annual standard. And then we have a standard that looks at how much you might have in a particular burst um, over a 24 hour period. Um, and the reason that the EPA has these two different standards is that there's different health impacts and uh, there's different sort of issues that come up over those different timeframes. Um, the annual standard is really trying to get at what is the overall pollution burden that we're seeing in a community over time, whereas that 24-hour standard is looking at, okay, well, you might have a relatively low pollution burden over time, but you have like these four days where there's just like an incredible amount of pollution, and we know that those short-term emissions can also have um, uh, health hazards, particularly cardiovascular hazards, and so the January 6th announcement was that the EPA was going to recommend changing the average annual standard from 12 micrograms per cubic meter down to somewhere between nine and 10 micrograms per cubic meter, um, and that they were not going to change the 24 hour standard. So that was EPA's intended or proposed rule was to make this, um, this change on the average annual and to leave the um, 24 hour standard uh, alone. And for prescribed fire, this is, as I said, it's kind of a mixed bag. Like more restrictions can be problematic and I can talk a little bit more about how that will actually play out. Um, but the 24 hour standard is the thing that your local air districts are really concerned about when you come in with a prescribed fire. 
um, because it, what we're looking at is spikiness in the level of particulate matter and not how much you're contributing to the um, total burden that a community might face over the course of a year. Um, so a little bit of a sigh of relief at that particular decision um, on, that EPA made, at least preliminarily. Um, however, what happened on January 6th was also a like massive coordinated effort among environmental, public health, environmental justice communities, like uniform voice that what the Biden administration did did not go far enough. And so um, they have all called... Um, called out for lowering the annual standard even further down to eight and to also lower the 24-hour um, standard down to either 30 or 25. Um, and the EPA has said that it's taking comments on sort of all of those different combinations of regulatory approaches. So this is not over yet. We got this temporary re reprieve from what EPA or I mean, guess temporary, not the worst case scenario from EPA. Um, but it is not, not over by a long shot, and I would not be surprised if the administration decides to do something different in the final rule, um, and they left themselves the leeway to do so. So what does this mean for us? Let's assume that the EPA um, moves forward with exactly what they said in this proposed rule. What will happen is it's going to be a big deal in California, particularly in the southern half of the state. So if you look at the regulatory impact assessment, which is Congress's sort of best guess about how this will play out. There, the majority of Southern California counties will be out of compliance for their annual average PM 2.5 emissions. Um, and that means that they will be demarcated as non-attainment zones. And some of them will be moderate and some of them will be severe. And what that means is that each of those counties will have to come up with, um, through their air districts, the what's called a state implementation plan that all gets rolled into one big state implementation plan for how they are going to um, address the fact that they're exceeding the standards. And they're going to have a lot of choices to make, and some of them could be good for us and some of them could be bad for us, right? What contributes to a community's air burden over the course of the year is not just prescribed fire and cultural burning, but is diesel truck fumes, it is stationary sources, it's power plants, it's agricultural dust. There's a whole soup of pollution that they are going to look at for how they can get themselves under the standards. And it will just depend on their approaches as to whether or not prescribed fire and cultural burning are in the crosshairs. Um, we could certainly see, and hopefully will see, that they're not, and that we continue to leave room in the budget uh, for annual um, air quality that is very protective of those activities, but it may be in some of these counties that they don't have a lot of other options. And so this, it could be that they start needing to ratchet back the amount of prescribed fire and cultural burning that is allowed. Um, if the 24 hour standard is changed, um, <laughs> we made a, a whole other world of hurt because um, most places will be out of compliance and the solutions for addressing those the spikiness in PM 2.5 really are gonna be targeted at things like prescribed fire and cultural burning that have that spiky profile. And so um, hoping that that is not what happens, uh, although from a public health perspective, that would be good. It would be good to ratchet that down. What we have heard, this is like behind the scenes gossip, I, I don't take it, it, take it all with a very large grain of salt is that EPA actually wanted and wants to reduce the 24 hour standard, but declined to do so at this point in part because of prescribed fire and cultural burning because they don't know how to fix it. And they don't wanna be in a situation of telling their co-federal agency employees over at US Department of Agriculture and US DOI that, hey, you know those plans you came up with to get us out of the wildfire crisis? You can't implement those because we just changed the rules on you. And so they, uh, the rumors are that, that like they're in looking for a fix, but it's really hard to come up with that, what that fix would look like. So what EPA wants us to do is to think about this all going through the exceptional events rule, which is the one mechanism we have in the Clean Air Act to take the data that you get at that monitor and then back out pollution from it and say it doesn't count against those standards. Exceptional events filings, while technically available for prescribed fire and cultural burning, have never been used for such. They've been, it's been available to do that, clearly available to do that since 2016. 
There's not once been a filing done. And the reason for it is that air districts have a incentive that it does not align with them using the exceptional events rule. So let's say I'm the air regulator and Lenya comes to me and says, hey, I want to burn. And I'm saying to myself, okay, well, Lenya is going to cause an exceedance of the 24 hour standard. Um, and what are my choices here? Hmm, I could say to Lenya, no, come back another day. Or I could say, oh, look, there's this exceptional events rule that I might be able to use. And if I say that that's what I'm going to use, I'm going to sign myself up for a six month process of data analysis that probably costs tens of thousands of dollars. And who knows what the result will be at the end. Like, I'm clearly going to tell Lenya, no, come back a different day when you don't cause an exceedance. And so there's, there's this misalignment of incentives. And so there's a national um, prescribed fire working group that we're working with to try and come up with alternatives to this that could both be potential regulatory fixes that EPA could implement, or here in California, talking with CARB about whether there's things that CARB could do um, to help with this process. Certainly, they will be able to in revisions to state implementation plans um, and potentially in supporting any need for exceptional events filings. Um, also, looking at some sort of in conversations with the House Forestry Caucus about um, some bigger fixes to the Clean Air Act that might start to look at um, prescribed fire sort of more honestly as a part of natural background conditions and what that might look like. That would involve a change to the Clean Air Act itself, which has not been amended since 1990. You know, it's an interesting time in the, I think most people think that, that Congress is like completely stalled for the next two years while we have a House and Republican control in the Senate and um, the Biden administration on the Democratic side. But I'm hearing that there might be some room for this because it would keep it really narrowly focused. There are some Republicans that, that support this type of work. And so we might be able to actually get something through the House. And as long as it's narrowly constrained, it doesn't reopen the whole Clean Air Act, it might actually make its way through. But I'm an optimist and maybe I'm wrong about that. So anyway, I will pause there. Thank you for sitting through 15 minutes of Clean Air Act talk. I see you all have turned off your cameras and are probably sleeping. So <laughs> apologies for that. No way. That was great, Sarah. Um, super interesting and, and so important that we keep track of this. Um, Lindsay. I think she's just applauding. Oh, just applauding. Oh, yeah. No, no, I was I was fixated the whole time. You had me. <laughs> Yeah, no, this is, I mean, Sarah's so awesome. Like that was like a whirlwind hour and 20 minutes of learning for everyone. So um, what other questions are coming up for folks? Any questions about that, the EPA stuff or about anything else we covered today? We have about 10 minutes. Um, I will just say one thing on the EPA stuff. Um, we're working on a comment letter that will likely be a sign-on letter. And so the comment period for EPA ends on the 28th of March, um, hoping to have some a draft done by the early part of March. So be on the lookout. We'll try and circulate something. So if your organizations want to sign on, there will be that opportunity. Great. And yeah, Kirk, uh, we've we've discouraged Kirk. <laughs> um, yeah, it's easy to get discouraged. It is a really hard time right now. Um, and it, you know, I. I think the, yeah, the EPA stuff, we'll see how that plays out. I don't think we should get too discouraged quite yet on that. Um, and a lot of the other things we talked about, you know, we are making progress. And I think that the PBA model at its root is really about us just continuing to do this work and not necessarily getting bound up with a bunch of funding and a bunch of the other things that tie us to a lot of these rules. So um, it's still our right to burn. <laughs> And uh, and that's what this group is about. That's what all the work we're doing. So don't get too discouraged, Kirk. Um, what other thoughts or, or questions do people have in these last few minutes? Yeah, just get fire on the ground. That's that's really where it's at. Jared, what do you have to say? Uh, yes, um, I had a I had a quick question about uh, I guess about the EPA stuff. Um, I remember I, I recently talked to our local APCD here in the San Joaquin Valley, um, <clears throat> Western Sierra, Southern Sierra. And um, I was trying to follow up on something I've heard a couple of times over the past couple of years from Dar Mims mm -hmm. of uh, CARB, California Air Resources Board, where he said, uh, basically he's made blanket statements that um, 
no matter where you are, you should be able to um, gain a cultural or economic exception to burn on what is the district has declared as a as a no burning day. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, because the, the rationale is that if you have a, a crew lined up and, you know, for logistical reasons, you can't burn on on any other day or for cultural reasons you know this 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 has to be the day um but uh that was sort of news to my local apcd uh mm -hmm. and you know they said uh uh because they are far from attainment i mean this is like the worst you know air district in the nation yeah. um that he was he was skeptical i mean he said he gave me some things to do to you know, kind of give them notice ahead of time and, and that sort of thing. But he was skeptical that that exception could work here. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you had any thoughts yeah. on that. Before. There is a process for <laughs> variance under when there is sort of a, a blanket no burn day from your air district. There is a variance process, um, at least in the law. I am not super aware of it being used, but I could be wrong about that. Lenya? I can speak to that. Yeah, we use it a lot, actually. Um, and But I've never heard of a cultural pathway for that. Um, so that's kind of interesting. It's, it's kind of an archaic process where you have to um, do document economic loss and say that you have to burn on this day or else you're going to lose money. Um, I think that's so stupid. I, you know, it's like, but it's pretty easy to do if you say I have resources lined up and they're worth this much money. Um, so that's what we do in Humboldt County. We've we've used that option a lot to burn on no burn days. Yeah. Um, but it, it's interesting, yeah, that that piece on the cultural side. I mean, I think it makes a lot more sense to have variances based on on cultural or other reasons than on economic loss. Yeah, I mean, it comes from the fact that our smoke management guidelines are like in the in the section on agricultural burning, like so that like it it makes sense to me that that is the way the statute defines it because if we're talking largely about it being um, for farms and ranches and that sort of thing, of course that's what we're going to focus on. But I'll look back at it, Jared, and see about this cultural piece, um, and be very curious to know what they mean by cultural, like right. <laughs> what, what yeah. is defined as a cultural need and who gets to decide that so yeah well I, I was thinking that I would look Dar up again you know send him an email or or give him a call yeah. uh sometime soon but yeah thanks yeah. Dar is great and supportive yeah. and generally responsive so I think that's a good route yeah, right. yeah. thanks yeah what else we've got about five more minutes and I guess I'll just say, so I will send out an email um, about SB 310 because we we really want to garner a lot of letters of support for that um, from a broad swath of folks. Um, I don't think any of us have a reason not to support <laughs> tribal sovereignty around these issues. So I'll look for that. I'll probably send it from my Northern California Prescribed Fire Council um, email address because I'm not supposed to do lobbying style activities from my UC address. So um, yeah, keep an eye out for that and write a letter if you can. Um, you can be an individual or an organization. I think everything helps. Yeah, and um, in particular, if you are affiliated with or have connections to any tribes or tribal organizations, I think that um, Senator Dodd's office is particularly interested in that support, though any support is really um, encouraged and appreciated. Yeah, and the support really matters. I mean, we have saw that, I think, uh, especially with Senate Bill 332, that was kind of like people didn't think that would pass. I know I always say this, I'm a broken record, but it was like you all submitting letters was so huge and they saw support for that bill like they'd never seen before. And it was like, how can you not pass something like that? So it really does make a difference and people look at that. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is that I have um, private foundation support for Sarah's time. And so I have a little pot of money that I use to, to help bring her into settings like this. And I have in the past um, worked with certain PBAs to connect with Sarah and to cover costs of her time to help with like really specific projects. So if your PBA has something that requires legal advice or where you want to tap into Sarah a little bit more, reach out to me. I would encourage everyone not to just be like sending Sarah questions and like emailing her directly. Uh, I want to guard her time. Obviously she's brilliant and like an extreme asset for all of us. So if you have something that you need help from like from her, 
reach out to me and I might be able to use some of that support I have to, to make that happen. Um, but let's not bog her down with, with random emails. Um, um, although like letting you also, if people have, have paid money and want me to do work for them, she is a, a resource in that way. Um, mm -hmm. but if you want that support from the PBA side and you don't have funding, um, consider me a resource. I think we can work, we can work things out. We've done that in the past. Um, so I think with that, let's just say thank you to Sarah. I feel like, um, Sarah, I almost feel like we should like go on the road with this, you know, <laughs> I mean, that would be like such a delight. Let's You're <laughs> nerdy, but I think we'd have an audience out there. <laughs> um, no, Sarah is just so great and so smart and I feel so lucky to work with her. So, um, Thanks for making the time. And it, like you have so much information packed into that brain. Um, it's really cool to be able to access it. Yeah, of course. Um, thank you, everyone. It's been a great time to be here and go get good fire on the ground. And if you ever, you know, especially if you're in the Bay Area and want like a lawyer to lurk in the sidelines, <laughs> let's get out on the field. So let me know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's get Sarah out on some burns. Um, and we will be following up with another, uh, we're going to just continue to have these, these fireside chats like every month on different topics. And I think coming up in the next two months, we'll have one that's just like more of an open forum for us all to, to talk about different issues related to PBAs and stuff. So um, thanks for coming and thanks Delphine for helping organize and we'll see y'all soon. Sounds yeah. good. Thanks. Take care.